Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you uh, hoping Mark Hall Patton would be here hosting tonight, I'm sorry to disappoint you, so uh, you're stuck with me. Anyway, my name is Sean DeFrank. I'm one of the directors of the Henderson Historical Society. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, looks like we're going to have a, gr a good crowd for this, and uh, looks like some knowledgeable people about the raceway, so any of you who uh, have stories or comments or anything, I'd like you to share them afterward. But uh, tonight we have one speaker. Well, actually, let me start off with a couple things. First, uh, let me tell you about our next couple of events. Uh, the next one is on Wednesday, March 18th. Uh, it's celebrating uh, Wyndham Kimsey, owner of uh, TSK Architects, and he's going to be showing uh, some of his stuff in downtown Henderson, and that's going to be in Water Street. And then Saturday, April 18th, uh, Pioneer Industrial Days, honoring all the founders of the Black Mountain Golf Course and Country Club, Herschel Trumbo, Jack Miller, Joe McBeth, Dave Jamison, and Lou Laporta, uh, who were all founders of the Black Mountain Golf Course. So th those are the next couple coming up in March and April. Also, we have a, a, a Tasty Memories fundraiser at the end of April also, April 25th. That'll be outdoors at the, uh, at the Clark County Museum on Boulder Highway from, uh, from 6 to 8 o'clock that night. Um, also want to tell you about the, especially for all you uh, auto aficionados out there, your Henderson license plate. It's only available through the rest of this year, depending on how many are sold. So. If you do have any intentions on buying a Henderson license plate, this year is the year to do it. You don't have to wait for your license or registration to be coming up. You can, you can just go down there and do it. Uh, you can do it online. I believe the cost for it is $67, and the proceeds for the plate do go to support the Henderson Historical Society and do help us put on these, these type of events. And we would like to grow our events, so the more, the more support we can get, you know, the better events we can put on. So I'd like to thank you in advance for, uh, for your support there. Um, let me get out my notes here to introduce our speaker. Okay, somebody asked why does it have to be done this year? If, if 3,000 license plates of the Henderson license plates are not sold by December 31st of this year, then the plate is discontinued because not enough people will have bought it. So there is an urgency to it this year. Okay, our speaker tonight is Randy Cannon. He is the co-author of this book, Stardust International Raceway, Motorsports Meets the Mob in Vegas, 1965 to 1971. It covers a lot more than that, I can tell you. Uh, Randy is a businessman and writer. He grew up in the Las Vegas Valley. He attended many of the races at the old Stardust International Raceway, which was near Tropicana and, and Rainbow. Uh, Randy moved out of Southern Nevada in 1984, eventually moved back here in 2010. And it was uh, after that, about five years ago, that he started getting just curious about the old raceway and thinking back on it. So he started to research it. And that research is basically what resulted in this book. And like I said, not only uh, does it examine the raceway, it looks really at the evolution of motorsports in Southern Nevada from its infancy to the uh, early 70s and uncovers a lot of the mob and political ties that went along with some of these land deals with the racing properties. So it's a really interesting book. It does have no less than three chapters on the, uh, on the old Henderson drag strip, which was also known as uh, Thunderbird Raceway. It operated in Henderson, <coughs> excuse me, I hate uh, talking in front of people, so I'm a little nervous. Anyway, it uh, operated in Henderson off of Boulder Highway on the opposite side across from the plants, um, kind of back where the old Ben Stepman uh, Hyundai was. And it operated there from uh, November 1958 through April 1964, and it was Southern Nevada's first dedicated drag racing strip. And so I guess without any further introduction, uh, further introduction, I'll give you Randy Cannon.
Green light is on. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for having me. It is a, it's a great turnout. <clears throat> I'm honored to be invited by the Henderson Historical Society to be part of the Henderson Speaks series. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Sean. Um, I think you took care of about the first 25 slides. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down and take a break. I, uh, thank you for turning it up a bit. Can everybody hear me in the back? Very nice, thank you. <clears throat> I noticed the student seating here in the auditorium. Sean, are we testing on this at the end? <laughs> Apparently not. <clears throat> the, uh, the slide that you see here, I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth between monitor and, and uh, the images here. I'll, I'll use the laser pointer a little bit, but the image that you see is indeed the Henderson Motorsports Facility. Uh, generally, uh, to, what it, to the extent it's remembered, it's remembered for drag racing. There was, however, a single nationally sanctioned road racing event at uh, this, the, uh, uh, the uh, facility, and uh, I have a few slides that delve into that. It was also used in the filming of Viva Las Vegas. I've got a few stills from that that we'll take a look at. My book at the lower uh, right corner there, uh, it, the, the, the central thesis is Stardust International Raceway, what came before Las Vegas Motor Speedway. And, and as Sean mentioned, in, uh, I, I uh, attended some of the premier events at Stardust Raceway in the 1960s, and I'd always I'd carried these memories with me forever. The competitors at Stardust were the, the, the cream of international motorsports competition. Formula One champions, Indy 500 winners, uh, the, the, the premier uh, racers uh, uh, in sports car racing, but also uh, NHRA and AHRA drag racing. Uh, the three most uh, prominent names in, in the history of drag lore in my book, D uh, Don Garlitz, Don Perdome, and Tom McEwen, all raced at Stardust. They were all interviews for the book. Uh, on uh, uh, road courses, uh, Mario Andretti raced there. He was my very first interview for the book. Uh, Bobby and Al Unser raced there. Uh, any number of, of, of uh, very prominent uh, racers uh, raced there. Roger Penske as a team owner raced there with his driver, Mark Donahue. Uh, the McLaren uh, team, now known more for Formula One, but Bruce McLaren and Denny Holm raced there. And uh, for those that remember the Can-Am series, uh, Jim Hall raced there with his, with his famous high-winged chaparrales. It was, it was really a, a, a nexus for, uh, for world-class, premier-level motorsports in the Las Vegas Valley. I really focused my research in 2015, and as I dug into the, the underlying dirt of Stardust International Raceway, this fascinating story unfolded. And um, I, I, was able to, I was able to document a fair amount of the, of the kind of the, as you mentioned, the, the deals, uh, the, it, that involved uh, politely uh, gamblers, uh, gravel barons, and government officials. As the story unfolded, it was more like racketeers, mobsters, and, and corrupt politicians. <clears throat> and I also was aware that there was professional motorsports at the old Las Vegas Park Speedway. Does anyone here remember Las Vegas Park? It was a, the thoroughbred track, thank you. Uh, uh, right where the, where the Kirk Kirkorian's International Hotel was built, immediately north of where the convention center was first developed. It was uh, later branded uh, Las Vegas Hilton, then LVH, now it's the Westgate. But right there on the east side of, of Paradise, directly across from the quarter horse track that was behind the Thunderbird. <clears throat> so I was aware of that there was some professional racing there and, and uh, I wanted to try to figure out how to stitch together this origin story. And as Sean mentioned, um, Henderson, provided almost 25% of the storyline and about a third of the, of the motorsports timeline in the book. The book covers events from uh, basically the origin of uh, Basic Magnesium Incorporated in, in the early 40s as a war materials production facility, uh, 1942 roughly, all the way through to 71 when Stardust International Raceway closed, the Henderson years from 58 to 64, and then also the final disposition of the old Stardust property developed by uh, Pardee Phillips uh, for uh, Suburbia. <clears throat> and uh, the, the people who touched the property, its connections locally, regionally, and nationally are just fascinating. As I dug into the Henderson property, it was really no different. In some ways, it was more fascinating. Uh, basic, um, uh, basic Management Inc., as the privatized plant was known, was the landlord of the drag strip directly across the, across the highway. That was BMI property, 
It was immediately uh, south of the uh, effluent leach fields that are still out there. I don't, know if that, I don't know if that property will ever be cleaned up to the point that it can be developed. And much of the, much of the drag racing property is still there. Uh, there's a slide in here that'll kind of point up the folly of that piece of property as the track was closed in 64. So um, just a, a couple of housekeeping things. You've all been here before, I haven't, but exits are out the back if we have an event and out the main, main exit, restrooms are uh, out the doors and to the uh, down the hallway to the left. Um, I, I did talk to uh, Rick Watson about bringing some copies of the book if anyone's interested. The, uh, uh, the book was published in 2018 by McFarland and Company. Uh, the publisher's price on the book is $50. It is a fairly thick book. Uh, and they don't, they don't run, put large runs of books together, typically fairly limited runs. Uh, but the net proceeds of the book are $15. And I told Rick I would contribute that to the Henderson Historical Society at the end of the evening. So with that, I'm going to jump in. Again, I'll have to bounce back and forth between the, the, the devices. Uh, in this image, we see a 32 Ford. I think it's a 32. I know there's a couple people in here who will correct me if I get any of these vehicles wrong that predate me. And uh, this is not the uh, Industrial Days event in 1960. We'll see this image in color later. The background image will be on every screen. And the distinctive uh, wooden timing tower of the Henderson Motorsports facility is in the background. So this is indeed the book. Again, three, three chapters devoted to Henderson. And, and I. I in, in hindsight, I really appreciate the book for an opportunity to look at valley lore and mob lore through this lens of motorsports. And it opened up stories about um, Julian Moore and Mayor Bill Byrne, and uh, to some extent, the Country Club. The Country Club uh, uh, is mentioned a couple times in the book. And the geography in Henderson, the original land acquisitions from the federal government, and how that uh, related to motorsports the early in Henderson Industrial Park land, uh, either side of Sunset between Boulder Highway and Whitney Mesa. Uh, that was a very uh, connected uh, uh, corporation. Uh, as I looked in, again into the properties of Stardust, Henderson, and uh, the old horse track, uh, typically there's a, there's a fairly well-known uh, Midwest racketeer who's come to Vegas to kind of sanitize their image. And they're typically no more than two handshakes away from someone like Meyer Lansky. Uh, it's just a fascinating history. And the, and the book allowed me to look at elements of Las Vegas history that have never before been, been uh, uh, drilled into. <clears throat> this is one of the early images in the book. Uh, this, will, this kind of format will, will form the presentation. I've got over 100 images. I hope you all can stay to see the images. Most of them are, come directly out of the book, as does this one. I think this one came from the... Uh, City Henderson Archives. This is uh, the basic uh, magnesium plant in 1942, constructed by uh, Bruce McNeil and McNeil Construction. Uh, McNeil Construction also constructed the, the uh, Las Vegas Park Speedway horse track, the dunes, any number of other properties. Scotch 80s were a uh, Bruce McNeil property development. The, uh, the, for purposes of the book, the first uh, organized legal and documented drag race that I could find in, in the Las Vegas Valley occurred on BMP Road, now Las Vegas Drive, right there in front of the factories on, uh, I believe it was uh, January 2nd, 1955, right after uh, New Year's. And uh, I found it in, of all places, in the, uh, the uh, newspaper of the Basic Wolves. <clears throat> I looked high and low for, for a comparable documented event in uh, Las Vegas, and I couldn't find anything until about 1957. So uh, this, this, uh, this gets, this, Henderson gets the honors in the book. This is the uh, uh, this is images from 1973 uh, U.S. Geological Survey aerial. This is BMI. This is Las Vegas Drive in both directions, Boulder Highway, and this is the Lake Mead. I'm sorry, Lake Lake Mead, Boulder Highway. This is the old drag strip grade here. In 1962, the facility was uh, further developed by Harry Polk and Joe Wells, who get a fair amount of run in the book. Uh, their, the, their path through the timeline is not particularly pretty, more often than not. But you can see there, there was a turn up here at the, uh, at the east end, right up next to the leach fields, and it returned back into the pit area. And then this, this very oddly shaped paved banked oval, which we'll see a few times, 
uh, was, uh, it, was, it was billed as something that was gonna attract NASCAR and IndyCar to the valley. It never did in that, in that form. It was very poorly constructed. Uh, but most of this is still there right next to Boulder Highway. There's still pieces of as asphalt there on the grade. And uh, uh, let's see, Henderson Hyundai would be right about here. So I, I wasn't able to find documentation about this event, but there was, there was uh, organized drag racing throughout the valley. Henderson racers typically raced in Vegas. Las Vegas racers typically raced in Las Vegas. Basic Wolves versus uh, 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 Vegas High. And so, and so it went. And the recollections of, of the octogenarians from Henderson are different than the recollections from the, from the uh, Las Vegas population. But this is on uh, Vegas Drive. Uh, pretty close to Lorenzi Park and uh, the, the uh, municipal golf course. And uh, this is Cecil Freddy, who's still with us. He's about 80 years old. He was uh, probably 16 here. Cecil told me that this was Fred Gibbs. Uh, the Gibbs family had a junkyard and, and uh, kind of a parts store on A Street. Uh, Raleigh thinks that's probably not his brother, but... but uh, uh, unfortunately, it made it in, right, wrong, or otherwise, it made it into the caption in the book. And this is a, a fellow named Jesus Molina. Uh, pretty good period look at a mid-1950s uh, dragster. And it's, it is in the book. I see a camera in the air, so I'm going to sit tight. I use this image. This is from the Library of Congress. It, it probably dates 1942, 43. Uh, but BMP Road was was uh, directly behind the photographer's uh, vantage point there, and so it was it was it was a nice way to illustrate what uh, this piece of geography looked like at the time, and uh, what the uh, to underscore what the purpose of BMI was in the first place, uh, to produce uh, uh, bring ore down from Gabs generally by way of Wells Cargo, and process it into magnesium metal and then ship it down to, the, uh, to weaponize it in the Los Angeles fighter factories and bomb plants. Good look at the valley here. This is 1954-55. This is, uh, let's see, this road here is, it was called Paradise Valley uh, at the time. Now it's simply Paradise. This is Las Vegas Park, the thoroughbred track. These are the old stable buildings. This is Desert Inn. This is the, let's see. This is the Riviera nine-story tower under construction, and pr probably the Thunderbird right there, the Sahara would be down in this area. Uh, Sunrise Mountain and Frenchman Mountain, very prominent. This little oval in the, in, here is the, uh, it was variously known as the Frontier or the Silver Slipper Sports Drum. It ran in the mid-50s. Generally regional uh, quarter midgets, midgets, and jalopies. It gets a couple mentions in the book, but it wasn't premier level nationally sanctioned motorsports, so uh, just a mention. And then, whoops, excuse me, went crazy there. And then uh, this is the, uh, the old Route 91, the Las Vegas Strip. The uh, first documented uh, premier level professional motorsports event in uh, the Las Vegas Valley was at Las Vegas Park Speedway. This was the finale of the then AAA uh, IndyCar season. Uh, Jimmy Bryan was second in the Indy 500 and won the national championship, and he won the Las Vegas event uh, going away. Uh, that is him uh, in the infield after the event. This was uh, November of 1954. That's a good look at Las Vegas Park. Um, this is looking roughly out to the, roughly out to the north, northwest. Uh, the uh, the Indy, uh, open wheel Indy cars on their dirt tires, same cars that ran in Indianapolis at the Speedway at the time. They'd, be, they'd, be, they'd enter the turn at about 140 miles an hour and slow down to a, about 100 miles an hour as they slid, ar slid around the corner. This image is under construction probably between 1951 and 53. The, first, uh, the introduction in the first chapter generally focuses on the, uh, the speedway, Las Vegas Park Speedway, and uh, it was just a fascinating piece of property, all kinds of hands in it, uh, lots, of, lots of mob connections some political connections, and ultimately uh, it, it was uh, ran, run twice into bankruptcy. Just a really interesting piece of dirt, and it came out of its bankruptcy purchased by, uh, oh my goodness, Joe Brown. 
from, uh, I believe he's from New Orleans, very prominent name around town. And uh, uh, Mo Dalitz was instr instrumental in, in this particular piece of property. Uh, I'm sorry, the property on the uh, south end being set aside for future convention center development. This is 1959, I believe. Uh, this is Fred Lorenzen. He was a national stock car competitor. This was the third premier level uh, professional motorsports event in Las Vegas, again at the Las Vegas Park Speedway. One mile dirt oval. oval. It was, uh, most of the races had a lot of controversy. Uh, the track would break down and holes would emerge. They'd, they'd inevitably run long in, into darkness. Uh, and uh, had, had to get cut short, and uh, was, it was fun to write about them. This, this is uh, November of 1959. Fred won the 1959 USAC Stock Car Championship at the event, and then he went uh, NASCAR racing the next year. In 57 and 58, the next leg of professional motorsports in the Valley, before we uh, sit out in Henderson for a while, was professional drag racing on Highland Drive. Spencer? Spencer Sharp over here, very good. Spencer remembers it. Uh, this was this was sanctioned, road closed, legal professional drag racing. Typically, got a write up in the local paper, got written up in the drag racing periodicals of the time. This is the nine story Riviera Tower. This is Desert Inn. This is Paradise Valley Road. Really an interesting look at Paradise Valley at the time, such as it was. Fair amount of green out there, and. Uh, nine-story Riviera Tower, and this, this, where the truck is right here, this is Highland Drive. These uh, roadways here were early um, sightings, if you will, for uh, warehouse development. And then this is the old uh, Union Pacific Rail Grade, and this is uh, industrial right here. I believe this is, this is probably the uh, Thunderbird right here, and this is probably the Royal Nevada that got absorbed into the Stardust. Anyone remember the names Carl Gratz and Norm Walker? See a few hands. Uh, they, they teamed in a, uh, typically an Oldsmobile powered dragster. They were, they were, uh, they were the, kind of the, the cream of the, of the uh, high class dragster crop in Las Vegas and raced around the Southwest. Uh, Norm Walker was the cousin of Pete Finley who founded Pete Finley, the Pete Finley Oldsmobile Agency and, and its long history as the Finley family of, of dealerships. Norm, and uh, Carl Gratz was a butcher. I think he spent most of his career down at Loveland's Country Fair Market at 25th and Bonanza, Eastern and Bonanza for you youngsters. Uh, this is Highland Drive. You can see the, the Riviera Tower there in the background. Let's see if I was able to date this event, early 57. But uh, that's a pretty good look at a, at a period, uh, very competitive period dragster. And this, this truly is Highland Drive. Uh, Get another image, we might see a, oh, here we go. The same dragster later in the year. It's got aluminum bodywork on it now. This image is looking west. And you can see the vast desert expanse with absolutely nothing on it. Uh, this is kind of an example of how exploring motorsports in the valley uh, created opportunities to look at a valley long before uh, its, its, uh, its current look. This also is Highland Drive. This is a local car, uh, Jim Epperson. Car Club was the Crap Shooters. And uh, they, uh, see, this is a October 1957 event. I believe there, there, were, uh, there were some racers from Henderson at this event. And you can see uh, Frenchman and Sunrise there at the right edge of the photo. Whoops. This is also uh, Highland Drive, very prominent view of uh, Sunrise and Frenchman Mountains. This is a, a car out of Bakersfield. The, the, the early races, they would typically draw, certainly the locals, but also cars from Arizona, Utah, California, sometimes, sometimes points back east. Hey, a car from Henderson. Um, actually, the, uh, the Henderson Historical Society Facebook page posted an image of this vehicle with a, with a caption out of the uh, old Henderson Home News. And I was surprised to find out that the, one of the owners was Frank Fuchs. We see a, a, a car for, of Frank Fuchs later in the show. Uh, but the owners of the car from the caption, Frank Fuchs, uh, Jim McCain, Skip Southern, Ronnie uh, Greenhall, and George Knight. And that helped me identify the names on the door. 
Uh, looked like Jim, Skip, and Ronnie, so I'm guessing Frank and George had their names on the other door. Uh, the caption said that the car started out at 3,200 pounds, and they drilled and cut and hacked and took about a third of the car out of it. A lot of times they drill so many holes that the cars actually got rather weak. But uh, it's all about saving weight, going fast. This is uh, Cecil Freddy. Anyone remember Cecil? Very good. And Archie Hanley. Uh, Cecil was kind of a young man about town, I'd say. This, this was his daily driver after he graduated from uh, Las Vegas High. Uh, heading down Fremont Street for the, uh, probably heading into the uh, early evening cruise. Cecil was uh, very generous with his, uh, with his scrapbooks for the, for the book. And uh, Cecil and I still, still stay in touch. In uh, late summer of 58, Cecil did this thing where he drove, uh, probably, probably Arky and Cecil drove all over the strip, and Cecil posed his car in, in, fr in the front of every one of the prominent resorts. And Alex in the back and I were trying to count the resorts that existed at the time on the strip, probably no more than nine. And I think I have nine images. Uh, but this, obviously, the Sands, Dean Martin would have been playing in the Copa Room. Uh, this is the, uh, certainly the Rat Pack era. The Flamingo. I'm, uh, I think they did this all in one day, just all up and down the strip. Really pretty car. It was a 27T Roadster. Uh, typically, it was burgundy in color. And I love the uh, skinny white wall tires on it. And then I pulled this one out, the old Thunderbird. The Thunderbird makes a splash in the early going of the book, uh, generally uh, to, to bring uh, Joe Wells into the story, minority partner of the Thunderbird at the time that it, that it kind of became uh, the, the central thesis of the book, The Greenfelt Jungle. He was a minority partner to primary owners Marion Hicks and uh, Lieutenant Governor Cliff Jones. And uh, Cliff Jones, uh, was a, uh, just as a point of comparison, was a partner in the Henderson Industrial Park deal. So that, I probably don't need to say a whole lot more about that, but I will. So this is a mid-40s photo. I used it to illustrate the presence of, of Joe Wells and Wells Cargo in the storyline of the Henderson Motorsports facility and uh, Henderson uh, proper. Um, this is uh, one of his uh, tractor trailers that he would have brought down from Gabs, Nevada with a load of ore. And, turned on to BMP Road from the highway. Really good look at the uh, ribbon of Boulder Highway headed out to Las Vegas. The uh, drag strip was located roughly over here, I think is the way I captioned it. Yeah, li Library of Congress. They, a really they have a really good collection of Henderson photos. I hope the, the Historical Society has, has uh, grabbed them or the uh, archives. Julian Moore, he was tough to write. Uh, um, he was in the War Assets Administration during the World, uh, World War II era. He uh, was very pivotal in the privatization of BMI from basic magnesium to basic management. And then he was the manager of the facility. He was the landlord of the drag strip. Uh, he was also a gambling licensee, which I had, I had no idea. He had gambling licenses at the El Cortez and the showboat, which uh, kind of put him in a different group of people. And uh, uh, he was also a partner in the Henderson Industrial Park deal, uh, which was a, uh, uh, it's a tough word to use, but a very racketed, very connected, very uh, mob underscored uh, uh, development. Here's a friendly photo. This is from City of Henderson Archives. This is literally the grading of the drag strip. I believe this was uh, Clark County and City of Henderson equipment. Um, this was fall of 58. That's the south edge of Frenchman Mountain. This would be Rainbow Gardens out here. Um, really happy that the archives had that image to help me move the storyline along. And here's the drag strip. It was opened in late fall of 58. This is from Cecil Freddy's collection. This is looking, uh, Boulder High would be, be directly behind the photographer, looking off toward uh, Rainbow Gardens, Vegas Wash area, and uh, River Mountains over in this area, and three kids over here. That's what, that's what it looked like at the time. And again, much of this property remains undeveloped. This image is a little soft, uh, but it's a, it's, it really illustrates the track well. The, the charioteers of Southern Nevada, Henderson members, Las Vegas members, kind of two camps, but they were, they, they were the 
driving influence in the creation of what was originally known as Industrial City Drag Strip. Uh, Gil Silva was very prominent in the Charioteers. I believe he's uh, had some connectivity with the society in the past. Uh, one of their members, though, a uh, fellow, fellow named Oral Bender, uh, uh, became the lessee of the motorsports facility, and, and uh, the fortunes of the facility really seemed to take a dive at that point. But uh, good look at the club coop and uh, the timing tower under construction. This is the bantam coop of uh, Cecil Freddie and Fred Gibbs. Uh, this is the Gibbs home at 1111 A Street in uh, just north of downtown Las Vegas. And uh, that's from Cecil's collection. This next image is the same engine in a uh, kind of a kind of a team dragster, if you will. They did a really good job putting together a uh, putting together a dragster. Fred, Fred Gibbs and, and uh, John Gilbert from Precision Machine, oddly enough, were quite instrumental in the in the development of uh, supercharger technology in the uh, late 1950s. In uh, kind of in in consultation with a fellow named out of out of Bakersfield, Ernie Hashim. So this is it. This is Henderson. Uh, that's Cecil on the left, Fred Gibbs in the center, and uh, a fellow named Wino Ray Greaves, uh, who was kind of just a uh, hang around the junkyard, couldn't quite get rid of him. There you go. Uh, Raleigh, Raleigh Gibbs said that Ray was as good a mechanic drunk as anyone else was sober, so fair enough. And this is the, uh, the same Bantam Coupe. Uh, clouds forming late fall, probably, uh, maybe winter. Just a really good look at what, uh, what, what, what got put together to race with in the time period. And up at the top left corner, that's the south edge of Frenchman Mountain. The, uh, the timing tower at Henderson, I, I, when I first saw images of it, I, I didn't think much of it, but it really, it was really the, the, it was the iconic piece of architecture, if you will, of the, of the Henderson Motorsports facility. This photo is from uh, Dan and Dave Westland. I believe Dan is still with us. Uh, Steve Westland uh, holds the collection of Dan and Dave Westland and shared a whole bunch of images for the book and really helped me photo illustrate the Henderson years. I believe that is Dan uh, on the ground and then Dan with the saw. I think he's on the right edge of, right end of that plank as he runs that saw. Nice look at uh, the factories right across the highway. I added these to the show after we previewed it, Sean and Rick. Um, on the left is, is the, uh, the first page of the charter of the Charioteers of Southern Nevada Car Club. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a period document from the late 1950s that uh, Steve Westland has. And on the right, this is also from Steve, this is the, the cover of the program for the 19... 59 Industrial Days event. That was the, that was the first uh, uh, invitational, nationally sanctioned drag race at, at the Henderson facility. There had been some local and maybe regional races between when it opened in late, late 58, but this is April of 59. Really fortunate to uh, be able to scan those documents. So here's a couple of images. I believe these are both in the book. This is the 1959 Industrial Days event. Gusick Brothers in that uh, orange, uh, I believe that's a, a oh, Ford, I believe. Uh, they're out of Arizona. And on the right is, uh, uh, is Dale Lewis here? Is Randy Lewis here? Randy Lewis just raised his hand in the back there. Randy's father, Dale, raced this car at Henderson in the uh, 1950s and 1960s. It was uh, acquired, oh, Dale? Dale Lewis? Thank you for raising your hand, Dale. Um, and uh, um, Frank Fuchs, if I, get, I want to get it right this time, Frank Fuchs, automatic transmission repair. He acquired this, this car from a fairly prominent national name, Kenny Lindley, and uh, campaigned it locally and regionally. And really pretty car. There's an image of it later in the show at the uh, Flamingo in, I believe, 1961. But this, these are from the Henderson track, really pretty images. 
This is advertising for the 1959 Industrial Days drags. Uh, the Industrial Days event ran from 59 to 64, always in the course of the Industrial Days Festival. It ran with a different name every year. I'm not quite sure why that was. I don't think it helped particularly with momentum, but that's how it worked out. Uh, Alex in the back asked me what this prize money was, would be worth today, and uh, that $200 top eliminator would be worth about $2,000 today. Uh, probably good money at the time, especially if I think this was paid silver dollars. Oh, silver dollars as opposed to savings bonds, and because uh, you can drop a silver dollar in the machine. <clears throat> You can't, you, can't, you can't run a savings bond through the machine. Um, but today, the, the, uh, uh, a, a nationally sanctioned drag racing event, the, the purse is probably a hundredfold or more over what the purse would have been back then. It kind of speaks to the, uh, uh, the relative infancy of, of uh, professional drag racing in society and sport culture. Here's a prominent national car from that 59 event, uh, top, the uh, top fuel dragster from uh, Sear and Hopper. Very pretty car. And this is a, a Southern California car, very, very competitive car from uh, Gary Cagle. He appears a few times in the show. Tony Waters for, was from Bakersfield, team of, of Waters, Sagru, and Gwynn. Very prominent national competitor. This boxy looking roadster that ran on nitromethane was the match of most of these slingshot dragsters in the time period. Uh, very competitive. Tony was the runner-up at the 1959 March meet that preceded, it's, that's uh, probably the Woodstock of drag racing history, preceded the Henderson event by uh, just a few weeks, and then he came here to Henderson to race. His, uh, his, uh, the winner of that 50, 1959 March meet in Bakersfield <clears throat> at the old Famoso Strip, st it's still in operation actually, was uh, Art Chrisman, very prominent national name, Art was billed for the Henderson event, but did not make it. And it wasn't uncommon in the promotion of the time to tease a name on a, maybe on the basis of a handshake and a conversation and things work out differently. But Tony was here and he won the event that day. Uh, here's the same team, Waters, Sagru, and Gwynn. I believe this is 1950, later in 59. They'd, uh, I believe they'd taken their DeSoto engine. Anybody remember the car Mark DeSoto? Uh, kind of under the Chrysler umbrella. They, I think they took the same DeSoto engine out of that purple Roadster and put it in the Dragster. I wanted to leave this here for a moment. If anybody, uh, Rick, I'll email this image to you uh, that the, uh, the host there is probably a local person. Maybe someone can identify her. You're welcome. I love this image. Uh, I think Rick might have blasted it out there. Uh, I wasn't able to identify the cars, but it's a really good look at the valley of the time period. This is, uh, let's see, October of 1959. This is the uh, wood fence that separated the drag strip staging area from Boulder Highway. Boulder Highway is probably uh, 50, 75 feet beyond the fence. You can see Boulder Highway uh, marked by the billboards heading off toward Las Vegas. Whitney Mesa right here, Spring Mountains, Mount Charleston beyond. The uh, property right here from Boulder Highway up to Whitney Mesa was the Henderson Industrial Park land. It was uh, acquired by the city of Henderson kind of in the second uh, grant from the federal government. And uh, it became a very connected piece of property. Um, uh, just so many names in the valley got involved in that property and names across the country got involved in that property. And again, a handshake or two away from organized crime. Nice uh, Chevy sedan from the time period. This was a, a, a California car. A lot of these are just kind of postcard looks at, at period race vehicles. Just uh, really, really nice photos. This photo was, uh, a number of the photos in the book were taken by Ernie Olson, who worked for uh, years at Channel 10. He was a producer and videographer and photographer. And Ernie's still with us. He lives down in, in Arizona. But he was uh, very helpful with imagery for the book. This car, I believe, is from California. It, went, it won a regional meet at uh, Henderson and uh, the A Action Auto. Uh, but that's basically, it looks, looks to me like going 140 miles an hour on a, pretty much on a skateboard. Really nice uh, Ford Roadster here. Just another look at what uh, 
race vehicles looked like in the time period. In the beyond there, that's generally the Rainbow Gardens area. And this is the pit and staging area for the drag strip, just rustic dirt. This is a prominent national competitor, Jack Crisman, a big name in the early evolution of drag racing from sports, from amateur to sportsman to professional and the development of dragster and funny car technology. Uh, Jack brought this uh, sidewinder dragster to Henderson in, uh, let's see, March of 60 and he set a new speed record of the drag strip of 180 miles an hour. The fastest dragsters in the, dragsters in the land were going about 185, 188 at the time. This image is a little bit rough. It's, this is from Raleigh Gibbs scrapbook. There's a number of these scrapbooks around the valley. Um, I wasn't able to get this cleaned up enough to get into the book, but this was, uh, Jack Chrisman came back two weeks after that 180 mile an hour mark, and he went 190 in this car. Uh, and it was, at the time, it was the, uh, the uh, speed record in the quarter mile uh, in all of the land, and it, that record was set here, uh, right here in Henderson. I really enjoyed writing this in the book. So there's our background image. I wasn't able to identify the car, but really pretty look at the drag strip and, and the geography beyond. Uh, the drag strip has kind of transitioned now from industrial city drag strip to Henderson drags. It was also known in the time period as Henderson Dragway. Really nice look. This is that 190 mile an hour car at the same event. This is the 1960 Industrial Days event. I believe this was called the Nevada Fuel and Gas Championships. Different driver, uh, I believe it was Lucky Ferris, same car owner. Did not break the 190 mile an hour record. Was about 25 miles an hour off. Really good look at the uh, at the drag strip and the, and the mountains beyond. Again, this is from the Dan and Dave Westland collection. Another one of their images. This is another national competitor, Leland Cobb, K-O-L-B. Uh, he ran at that 1960 event. I think he won his class at that event. Yeah, middle eliminator, middle eliminator. This one's kind of just for fun. Uh, I believe Demarest and Reed was from, I believe they were from Arizona. Spencer, do you remember? Dale? Uh, really nice little car, uh, super skinny tires, ran on nitromethane, and uh, 144 miles an hour in that thing, in the quarter mile. This is from Art Goldstrom's collection, same, same basic scrapbook. This is uh, Tony Waters came back, kind of updated the Roadster, it's now uh, yellow. And uh, this Roadster ran at least through 1964. Here we are at, at a September 60 event. They've now, they've uh, changed the supercharger configuration. And uh, I bet they're running a Chrysler instead of the old DeSoto in that image. Or a Dodge, perhaps. I wasn't able to identify anyone here. It's a nice look at the timing tower and the geography. The signage is Henderson Drags. The, the shirt on the track worker is Henderson Drags. Uh, I'll send you that image as well, Rick, see if anybody can shake out some names. Um, in the, 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 the drag strip was first sanctioned by the National Hot Rod Association, which was, which was quite a, an accomplishment. You've seen in the images, there's no permanent facilities other than that open air timing tower. But the National Hot Rod Association, somewhat in its infancy, predominantly from Southern California, they came up here and sanctioned this drag strip for NHRA competition and NHRA uh, recognized events. This was the last such event. The track is now being run by Oral Bender under a, uh, a lease that, uh, that effectively operated as a public-private partnership, part BMI, part City of Henderson, part this private party, Oral Bender. Uh, and this event ran, the qualifications were held on Saturday one weekend, there was a rain out late in the day. They did not race Sunday. Uh, Oral, in his wisdom, uh, canceled the insurance coverage and uh, uh, didn't send his, uh, uh, actually, he didn't send his insurance check to the National Hot Rod Association. And it became a tipping point in the drag strip. The, dra the drag strip shortly thereafter transitioned to sanction by the American Hot Rod Association. Fascinating uh, backstory of the AHRA that I'll get into. But this was. Uh, Gary Cagle in the car on the right. I wasn't able to identify the other car. 
Uh, I know Rod Stuckey was at the event, but I don't think that's him. Um, I believe this is the makeup weekend, the next weekend when they made up the rain, rain event. And I think, those, I think those mountains out there look somewhat familiar as we sit here tonight. So the drag strip has transitioned to the sanction of the American Hot Rod Association. Another first in the nation right here in Henderson. The first uh, nationally sanctioned national championship uh, meet west of the Mississippi was held right here in Henderson, Nevada on this drag strip. Uh, this preceded the National Hot Rod Association Winter Nationals by a few weeks in uh, uh, 19, where are we at? It was 1961. Um, you've got a better look at it than I do. So this was January, still pretty cold. Uh, this was three months before the Industrial Days event. Uh, but enter the AHRA. We'll talk about them a bit more. Jim Tice was pretty much the president for life of the AHRA. He was an, um, his day job was insurance salesman from Kansas City. And uh, the backstory on Jim was that he uh, generally cooked his books to avoid income taxes. And uh, his accountant also uh, ran the books for, I believe it was Kansas, Kansas City Teamsters Local 41. And uh, the, the combination of these relationships resulted in the Kansas City mob turning uh, the AHRA shows basically into a money laundering operation uh, by national accounts and uh, something I was able to incorporate into the book. And uh, I think I'll get to mention a little bit more about that later. But uh, Jim was quite a character. This was an image taken by uh, Don Elliott. He was the uh, field supervisor for the American Hot Rod Association. Really pretty look at the timing tower, painted white finally. Trash accumulated, one chemical toilet. I believe this was, I believe this was that uh, winter championship event. Very prominent national competitor of the time, Hayden Prophet. Uh, on the dirt staging area, waiting for his call up uh, to uh, turn left and get onto the drag strip. Uh, he, I believe he won his class at that 61 national championship event. Very prominent name at the time. This is uh, our guest in the yellow cap back there in the car on the, on, on the left, uh, Dale Lewis in uh, Frank Fuchs uh, ATR special. And he's competing against, I'm going to step up here, Lucky Ferris in the Aiken Stuffy Sanchez Ilco special. I believe it was the same dragster that Jack Crisman had run 190 with at the drag strip. But uh, Dale was in action that day. Thank you for being here, Dale. And thank you for, uh, thank you both uh, you and your son, Randy, for uh, being so helpful with the book. This is the, um, the event winner, if you will. Much like events at Las Vegas Park, Henderson was on the bigger meets, it was prone to run into darkness. This, this uh, first national championship event west of the Mississippi got called for darkness, and uh, the, uh, the purse was split. Uh, this fellow, Lefty, Lefty Muttersbach, who was a national class competitor, I believe he was the reigning uh, National Hot Rod Association champion the year before, but he was, he was the winner at Henderson that day. But it just, it's, it's, uh, it kind of uh, exemplifies the caliber of, of racer that came through Henderson. Uh, Sean, you mentioned it was the first dedicated purpose-built facility uh, in, in the valley. There weren't that many purpose-built facilities in the country. Uh, one of the first was right here in Henderson. There we go. That's Dale's car. Frank Fuchs automatic transmission repair special um, in front of the Flamingo. <clears throat> I don't know who the person is back there. Um, Randy, Randy told me the, I think you told me the story of the setup of the, the shot here, as your dad would have told it to you. Um, the Flamingo was an interesting property at the time. I, I really get a kick out of the old marquees. St Steve Allen and wife Jane Meadows performed, and, and uh, their contract was negotiated directly with Morris Landsberg, one of the three owners of the Flamingo at the time, and good old Mo from Miami was a, was a handshake relationship with Meyer Lansky. Uh, so there you have that. <coughs> John Boat was a competitor out of Arizona. Interesting little car. Uh, this is a March 61 event at the, at the drag strip. Good look, though, at, at uh, the dirt across the way. That became the uh, Henderson Industrial Park. I used images like this to kind of de depict uh, 
the connection of the drag strip to the industrial park and the commonality of the, of the people involved. This is actually it's a very pretty car. Nice look at the factories. This is Tom McCory in a car that he partnered with uh, Don Perdome. Again, one of the three most prominent names in early drag racing history. Beautiful little car. And uh, the chassis was reportedly built by a fellow named Kent Fuller, very prominent name in the early history of uh, uh, dragster chassis building. Good look at the fence. Always, in, always seem to be in some sort of disrepair. Good look at the factories. This was a prominent national competitor, um, the Reith Automotive Fiat. I'm trying to remember the driver of this. I didn't write it down. But uh, came to Henderson quite a bit. Really, really, pardon me? Jim Dunn? I, thank you. I don't know why I didn't get that in the uh, caption. This is uh, Pat Aiken's uh, car, the, uh, that same Ilko special. It was, the, uh, it was the top eliminator winner of the April 61 Industrial Days event which by then I believe was the Nevada Gas and Fuel Championships, a, a, a variation on the name. I used this image from the Library of Congress to kind of illustrate the geography and kind of lead into the development of, of the uh, single sports car race. Really good look. It's in the book. Really good look at the factories, a good look at the, uh, uh, the worker housing. This was taken from a... Uh, a security observation tower that kind of overlooked the entire campus. Good look at the valley beyond. Carl Gratz and Norm Walker kind of evolved their drag racing game and their relationship with Finley Olds to become more and more competitive locally and, and, and around the uh, western states. The, uh, you see the Finley name there on the, on the uh, quarter panel. Um, Finley's misspelled. I don't, I don't know how that happened. But uh, that's probably Norm in the, in the cockpit. Another good look at the, the drag strip, the fence, the factories. So uh, the fella in the uh, white shirt holding the poster um, is Richard Levinson. Uh, he was the son of Ed Levinson. Ed Levinson, very well connected, majority owner of the Fremont Hotel, handshake away from Meyer Lansky. Richard's a minority partner in the Fremont uh, and the Horseshoe at the time when Benny Binion was off uh, to prison. Uh, you know, Benny only killed people that needed killing real good. I hope you all know that. Uh, but uh, this is Formula One sh uh, world champion Jack Brabham at an endurance event at Riverside Raceway. And it looked to me like Richard had kind of pressed him to, into being a pitch man for some of you might remember this event, the uh, uh, Henderson uh, Speed, or I'm sorry, Horseshoe Speed Week. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a series of road races that involved the convention center property. Uh, racetrack drive, and I, and I believe convention center drive. Uh, and they might have run down the strip in front of the Thunderbird as well. That was in, uh, I believe that was 1962, September of 62. And the race was in October of 62. I use this, again, Library of Congress to illustrate uh, the uh, kind of evolution uh, for that sports car race. Uh, the original concept was to race on the, around the properties of BMI uh, it didn't happen. Then there was the uh, concept evolved to race around the triangle of Boulder Highway, Lake Mead, and Water Street. That didn't happen. But there did, it did lead to an e the effort to develop the uh, facility into a road course, uh, if you recall that image we saw earlier. Mayor Bill Byrne, another, he was a difficult part of the story for me. Um, very, in very involved with uh, a lot of very interesting people. Uh, and a lot of efforts, he and Julian Moore seemed to work in lockstep. He was a bit of a property speculator. Uh, I believe he was a gambling licensee. He was a gravel baron in his own right and uh, uh, had gravel claims uh, around the southern state. And uh, he was also, at one point, a paid employee of the Henderson Industrial Park while he was also the sitting mayor. So uh, he, was all, he was a very interesting part of the uh, Henderson Motorsports storyline. I've got an interesting letter from him soon that appears in a slide. So th this is uh, City of Henderson Archives. This is the, develop the, the redevelopment, if you will, of the drag strip into a road course. And the equipment is of uh, Harry Polk and Joe Wells is grading that bank turn, much of which is still there right adjacent to Boulder Highway. Good look at the industrial park property on the other side of the highway. 
same day. Uh, these are uh, these cars are from Southern California, uh, the uh, California Sports Car Club. They were very influential in the uh, uh, the management, if you will, of this one and only road race in Henderson. And uh, just as a point of order, uh, cars did not race at speed on that bank bank corner. They, the uh, sports car race, they pretty much traced the apron right here. Uh, good look at the dirt beyond. The, uh, the sports car race was paired with the traditional uh, April uh, drag races. This year it's the Southwest Fuel and Gas Championships, uh, $1,000 in prize money, uh, a few uh, prop uh, offers there, all in savings bonds. By now, uh, Oral Bender has been, uh, his lease has been terminated. Uh, his house in Las Vegas has been sold at auction, and uh, he has been probably run out of, run out of uh, the valley uh, on the railroad. And uh, the city of Henderson Rec Department took over the, the uh, operation of the drag strip. In my read of history, and as I was depicted it in the book, things didn't really get much better. Uh, the drag strip forever seemed to be short on funds. Funds went missing. It was just a constant source of rub and controversy in the, in the uh, local papers. So this is the 62 drag racing event, the Southwest uh, Championship. You can see the paved turn now. Uh, that's about all it was ever used for, staging for the drag races. Nice look at the factories directly across the highway. I believe this, uh, the Brown brothers, I believe they were out of Southern California. Really pretty car. Um, the same event, um, looking across the drag strip, that roadster is very similar to what Tony Waters ran. It was a pretty popular configuration at the time, the, the roadster in the far lane. This is Gary Cagle in uh, uh, the Moon Eyes Dragster, a, a very well-known dragster in the early 1960s uh, that was constructed by uh, Dean Moon, uh, a speed equipment manufacturer and distributor. Uh, the Moon Eyes uh, on the cowl there, are still, I mean, that's still everybody's favorite sticker today. Uh, among hot rodding, and especially uh, the nostalgia of hot rodding. But uh, Gary won his class at that 62 event. Good look at the bank turn in the background. This is the, let's see, this is Leland Cobb uh, in the near lane. Um, I believe he, yeah, Cobb was the winner. Uh, good look at the, uh, should be pretty recognizable mountains there. So the sports car race, uh, the blocky ad on the left uh, is from the Las Vegas Review Journal. The dash plaque there, probably about one inch by four inches, was uh, from the event, April of 28 and 29, 62. This was the week after the, the drag races. If you notice on the, uh, right here, Steve McQueen was billed to compete. Uh, he did not appear, not sure what happened there. This is the winning car. Uh, the, this car was uh, constructed by Max Bolkowski, who was a, a uh, pretty much hand-built uh, sports car constructor of the time period. He was also a prominent uh, stunt driver and producer on a lot of films. I uh, this car also appeared in Viva Las Vegas, uh, but he, he probably had, he had both of his, both, uh, two of his, uh, two of these cars in Viva Las Vegas, and he wrangled most of the cars that you would see in Viva Las Vegas. This is the winning car, uh, Old Yeller 3. It was yellow. All of this uh, body work is hand formed. This little car was driven by Bob Harris. This was, this was also billed for the event. This car was owned by Dan Blocker. Anyone remember the name Dan Blocker? Lots of yeses. I like that. Dan Blocker played Haas uh, Cartwright on the TV Western Bonanza. But Haas owned this car, and uh, Haas didn't show up, for, and nor his driver showed up for the event either. Not sure what happened there. I use this image to uh, depict the, the kind of the growing influence of Joe Wells in the, uh, the pro property of the drag strip, the operation of the motorsports facility. He, he was the, uh, he along with Harry Polk were the developers of that sports car course. And he was now the, he became the lessee of the motorsports facility. Again, it became extremely controversial. 
who, uh, who was entitled to what piece of the pie. Um, this is his much more famous, excuse me, his much more famous daughter right here. If anyone can tell me who that might be. Very good. Don, Don Wells, Mary Ann from Gilligan's Island. Thank you for that. A look at the further evolved uh, Finley Old Special of Gratz and Walker. We're uh, into the 62-63 time period now. This, uh, this jet car of Romeo Palomitas appeared at Anderson in 62 and 64, and the takeaway story from that car's appearance was that when they, when they lit the afterburner on the jet engine, it melted the asphalt on the, uh, on the banked corner. Really, really fun to write that. Uh, bit of a fuzzy photo, but that's the south edge of Frenchman. Nice looking 65 or 64, 65 F100. Must have been a 64. So here we go. Uh, I know Bud Walker is here. Um, he and his brother Ronnie shared this with me. Uh, they, they lived in, this, in uh, Henderson <clears throat> and got permission from Bill Byrne to uh, tow or push their drag strip from their home to the Henderson drag strip, February 1st of 63. Thank you, Bud and Ronnie. So we're into the 63 event now. That's Gary Cagle in the, in the image. That's probably, uh, probably a, I'm guessing, Indianapolis event, the NHRA National Championship. Uh, the, the prize money has stayed about the same for top eliminator. Dalby Shirley is still running the show, uh, rec department. The, uh, the, the, the raceway struggled, as it struggled with the naming of the event, it struggled with its name also. I think at one point I counted seven different names. Industrial City Drag Strip, Henderson Drags, Henderson Dragway, Henderson, Industri or Henderson International Raceway, uh, Henderson Thunderbird Speedway, and finally Thunderbird Speedway. But even in this image here, they build it as Thunderbird Raceway. That probably didn't help. <clears throat> this is the winner of the 63 event, a pretty, pretty famous dragster, another national competitor that came through town, the Frantic Four of Weekly, Rivero, Fox, and Holding. Um, this was contributed to the book project by an uh, artist and uh, uh, NHRA division manager. This is uh, Jeep Hampshire, I believe. Uh, Randy, was Jeep out of Southern California? Um, this is the all-time all elapsed time record holder of the Henderson drag strip, 7.97 uh, seconds uh, in Bill Martin's car. And it was in a, using a Chevy engine, which was rather novel in the, in the time period. Uh, that ET was never, was never bettered. <clears throat> Here we go. In the second to last scene of Viva Las Vegas, there's uh, the, the, uh, the fictitious, fictitious, fictitious Las Vegas Grand Prix. And uh, for those of you who recall the movie, these fantastic scenes of uh, Fremont Street and and uh, Valley of Fire and Lake Mead and Hoover Dam and all over the southern Nevada in impossible logical sequence. And there were about two seconds shot right here in Henderson. In July of 63, the crew was out here. They did all of that location filming in a single day. And uh, this occupies about two seconds of the film. These are screen grabs. Um, the, as, the, as the car comes to rest, it's... Uh, Boulder Highway is probably right about here, the edge of Boulder Highway. But in this image here, pretty good look at the valley beyond. And to my knowledge, that's the only time that cars raced around that banked corner. <clears throat> I use this image to depict uh, the story of the drag strip becoming more and more dominated by the Henderson Industrial Park and the really interesting racketeered group that underneath that industrial park property. Julian Moore was a partner. Your mayor, mayor Bill Byrne, was a paid employee of Polk Development. Polk was a partner. Joe Wells, Cliff Jones, the former lieutenant governor, and uh, E. Perry Thomas of, uh, Val of uh, I'm sorry, Bank of Las Vegas at the time. And now, then Valley Bank, yes, thank you. And a couple of uh, kind of rogue insurance executives from Galveston, Texas, who had set up a kickback scheme with Morris Schenker, whose name is most commonly identified with the Dunes or as a, an attorney for Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, but it, the connections in that industrial park uh, land deal just go on forever. 
So in October of 63, with one year left on the lease, uh, BMI terminates the lease of the drag strip. And this uh, image appeared in the Henderson Home News, the uh, iconic timing tower being toppled for uh, uh, a higher use uh, in property development. And as all everyone sitting here knows, that property still lies largely vacant. In fact, I, I flew into Vegas uh, about a week ago, and, and I'll be darned if, if there, it, I don't think it's the original drag strip grade, but there is a strip of grading that is right where the drag strip would have been. And uh, most of that property is still there, and obviously the leach fields to the uh, north are still there. This is uh, our guest, Dale Lewis, in the yellow cap in, in, the, uh, in Al Hunter's uh, fuel-burning roadster. Good look at the factories right across the highway. Cars are using parachutes now. I was really happy to get that, get that image in the book. Uh, Randy holds Dale's old images and uh, shared a number of images with the book. This is advertising for the last invitational event at uh, Thunderbird uh, Speedway. Again, uh, mislabeled Thunderbird Raceway. Uh, this is during the centennial year, 1964. Who remembers was here in 64? I was. Very good. Um, the, uh, the jet cars there in that, in that card on the right uh, were depicted in that earlier image. Let's see, the prize money still about the same. And uh, this was the last uh, documented event at the Speedway, even though the, the lease ran until October of 64. <clears throat> There's Al Hunter with uh, the uh, little yellow roadster uh, running on nitromethane. That's the car that, that uh, Dale raced at the time. Ernie Olson, uh, our photographer friend from Channel 10, was also a partner in a, in a uh, drag racing uh, car with a fellow named Paul Cully, very prominent around the valley. Uh, everybody loved Paul, uh, kind of a gentle giant sort of guy who also went into drag strip operations at Stardust Raceway. Uh, Ernie had his name on the side of the car. I believe that is St. George, not uh, Henderson there. A very pretty kind of a root beer colored car. This is, a, this is a very prominent car in drag racing lore, the Webster Hawk, Hawkins McLeod uh, fuel coupe. And uh, I found uh, Les Hawkins in, he uh, li was living in Reno, Nevada, and I told him what I was doing, and I found his car competing at the 64 event. He was the runner-up in his class to, I believe, Jim, Jim Dunn. And uh, he was so happy to have his car depicted in the book. He'd long since sold the car. It's been restored. It probably makes the car show circuit now, but... It's just this iconic machine that appeared right here in Henderson, and Les was so happy when I spoke to him. This is the top eliminator uh, uh, final, uh, Gary Cagle and uh, uh, Dave McKenzie. Not sure that's, that's that might be the, uh, the, the run before. Uh, I believe that is black, the edge of Black Mountain there, and the mountain, I believe that's the mountains by the college. Gary Cagle was a pretty consistent competitor at Henderson. The end of the run in Henderson, again, this is Gary's yellow roadster. Kind of a fitting shot. Uh, this is from the 64 event, the finale of professional premier level motorsports at the Henderson Motorsports facility from Industrial City Drag Strip all the way to Thunderbird Speedway. Nice look at Rainbow Gardens beyond. So, Thunderbird is closed. Uh, drag racers in the valley had to find another place to race, or they had to, uh, uh, some of them went racing on BMP Road again, and the uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, cutoff, Lake Mead cutoff. Uh, racing transitions to Stardust Raceway. How are we on time, Sean? Okay. Uh, and the game kind of steps up. This is uh, the ribbon cutting of Stardust Raceway on September 21st, 1965, way on the other side of the valley. Uh, Stardust was from Trop to Flamingo, Rainbow out to Buffalo. This is Mo Dalitz, president of the Desert Inn and Stardust. Allard Rowan, officer in the Desert Inn and Stardust. Carol Shelby. Uh, this car was raced at Le Mans and uh, appeared in name in uh, the movie Ford versus Ferrari, if anyone has seen that. A uh, fellow who was involved in the Stardust Racing Association partnership, of which Mo and Allard were officers. Uh, this is uh, uh, Bill Breer, who was a county commissioner at the time, and that 
shock of hair right there is Grant Stewart, who was a city councilman. This is the layout of Stardust. North is, is up. You can see the roads there. Trop was dirt. Buffalo really hadn't even been cut in yet. Flamingo was paved to the entrance of the, uh, the uh, uh, property. And Rainbow was a two-lane paved road. Good look, looking off toward uh, the Mount Charleston area toward the northeast. You can see the kind of the pass, the Highway 95 pass there. This is the, this, this uh, front straightaway was used as the drag strip uh, and as the, the front straight of the road course. Another good look off toward the northeast. The, as the timing tower was the takeaway icon of the Henderson Strip, the Martini and Rossi Bridge was kind of the architectural icon of Stardust. Real quick run through of the type of events. The first Stardust Grand Prix had world class uh, sports car racers. This was November of 65. Uh, Tran the Trans Am Series raced here in 67. Mustangs, Cougars, Camaros, oh my. The National Open was a kind of a second tier NHRA uh, uh, national drag race uh, just below the national uh, level. There were only four nationals at the time, so it was a pretty, uh, a pretty prominent series of drag racing. There was professional motorcycle racing, and the granddaddy of events at Stardust was the Can-Am series, the finale of the series, again, that featured Formula One racers, Indy 500 racers, uh, the cream of the sports car, uh, domestic and international sports car racers. This is the 68 event. We're looking roughly toward Flamingo and Buffalo, Spring Mountain area, Mount Charleston beyond. And uh, there was a big scrum in the first turn, but uh, that's Denny Holm, Mario Andretti, Dan Gurney, Jim Hall in the Chaparral. That's uh, w William Harris' uh, Ferrari 612P that didn't make it past the first turn. And that's uh, Swede Savage right there. William, it was fun to write a little William Hara into the, uh, the storyline. Carl Gratz continued drag racing. This is the Radio 1460 Kino Gambler that he raced at Stardust in uh, generally in 1965 and 6. Tom McEwen in the near lane won the 1968 Stardust NHRA National Open. Again, very prominent national name. Dan Blocker was the winning car owner of the 1966 round of the U.S. Road Racing Championship at Stardust. That's his winning driver, John Cannon, no relation, <coughs> allegedly. I really like this image. Uh, this is the competition eliminator final of that 68 event, February of 68. Good look at the... Las Vegas Valley, the undisturbed, unterraced McCullough Range, and the path up to the towers on Black Mountain. The Henderson Motorsports facility would be right over here, roughly. Really like that image. Kind of ties it all together. Bobby Unser won the one and only 1968 IndyCar event at Stardust, and then went on to win the national championship. Number three is Mario Andretti from that 68 event. He was an excellent interview for the book. There was a car named Stardust, Don Schumacher, one of the preeminent names in modern professional drag racing, uh, raced this uh, Barracuda funny car in 69 with sponsorship from the Stardust. Don's from Chicago. The Chicago backstory was made for a very interesting exploration of just who might his family have been connected to. This is the 71 event, the finale of uh, professional uh, NHRA national drag, I'm sorry, I should say the national open at Stardust Raceway. You can see the Martini and Rossi Bridge is very weathered. The, the asphalt in the foreground, very rippled. Uh, that's the uh, Kenny Goodell, the funny car winner on the left. This is the 1969 event. Uh, Mickey Thompson is in the center. Uh, he had both uh, cars in the funny car final. And I'm gonna, we're going to explore that ribbon of the strip beyond. I, I blew it up. Just a really interesting period look. For purposes of this book and, and mob, the mob lore background, I real, it was just amazing that the strip was all cloaked in shadow that day. But we see the landmark, the uh, international under construction. Uh, I believe that is the Sands, the Riviera. This is the, probably the Sahara. I believe that's the Stardust sign and the Flamingo sign. The mountains are very prominent in that long lens. but. Just the, the images that I, for purposes of motorsports, the, the backdrops of these images were just, they're absolutely fascinating. That's it. So much Henderson. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Randy. That was, that was fantastic. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Um, 
I'd like to open it up to if anybody has any questions for Randy or if anybody has any, any uh, stories they'd like to share from, from uh, back in the day racing. If anybody have uh, questions. Remember the Green Hornet as being the dragster down there, uh, as being the jet dragster. There, um, Randy, um, was there? Do you remember the Green Hornet coming through town, or, or was it? I remember there, there was a jet car, and it, I actually found an image of it posed in front of the Stardust. I believe it was Art Arfon's uh, Green, Monster. Green Monster. Thank you, oh, Green, Monster. Uh, Green Monster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a. Uh, that sounds about right. Um, and it, 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 the Art ran that Green Hornet through a few evolutions. I think his first his first car was probably a uh, World War II Allison V12 powered, and he ran it through. It seemed like it was before they had that back end built up. Because I lived on Church Street, and my stepdad and I went and crawled up on top of the roof and watched it go. Very good. That so that would be before 62 then. Very good. Yes, ma'am. Um, let's see. Down by the wash. Kind of the, yeah, kind of the, kind of low mountains, um, and, uh, just kind of a, kind of a garden of mountains, if you will, with lots of mineral color, different mineral colors in them. There you go, yeah. Very good. Excuse me, Randy. We have a question back here. Thank you, Sean. I didn't see any spectator stands at the Henderson facility. <clears throat> good point. There were no. There were. There were generally no stands, and there were. There were never any lights. And uh, I think it. It. The. Uh, it always ran on a shoestring. The money also always seemed to be going away from the drag strip instead of toward it. And uh, it. It really affected any traction, if you will. In, in developing it for long-term long-term motorsports purposes. Yeah, my uh, grandfather was uh, in the Satan's Car Club, and he's always told me they had a, a big part in assembling or putting the asphalt down the first time for the uh, Henderson drag strip. Did you come across anything? I, th I believe in the, the account I found in the Henderson Home News uh, generally attributes the, uh, the oil and aggregate to the charioteers, although it might have been a coalition of car clubs, and then it was rolled out by uh, uh, Wells Cargo. Anybody have uh, anything they'd like to add? Any stories from back in the day? Uh, anything? I see a hand. Yeah, I'm surprised that uh, you didn't mention the Craig Road Speedway. And that was in business for a, a number of years. Craig Road ran for a long time. Uh, I, as I started with Stardust, and, I, and I, as I researched the origin story, I had to kind of figure out what the boundaries of the book were going to be. And so I, I, I thought, if it's, if it's premier level, nationally sanctioned, can, part of a national championship. That's kind of where I wanted to focus the research. And I, as a kid, I went to Craig Road on, you know, 15 weekends a year. But it, the, uh, the, the nature of the racing there, the, the regional racing, just didn't cut, quite fit the thesis of the book. You mentioned the uh, Jet Dragster. Uh, I was there when uh, at least one of them ran. I was at the starting line. And the um, warm-up time was took quite a while, it was like three to five minutes or even more, it could have been seven to 10. As he's warming up, the oval, the top three feet, is starting to melt. So when he did hit AB, afterburner, uh, the top three feet blew out onto Boulder Highway. There were cars passing by. You could see people, because nobody was behind the jet, you could see people away from it running over the side and the back to see if they could help out with the people. Uh, there were probably eight to ten cars that had windshields blown out, uh, cars damages, damaged, and um, it was the one and only time that they let that jet take off from there. 
So the turn was a bit of a blessing and a curse. If, what would have happened if it hadn't been there? I, I think in the book I, I, I described it as uh, it would have roasted a station wagon. Anybody else have anything? Uh, at Henderson? No, no. In the introduction, I, I kind of position Las Vegas Motor Speedway and what it is now. And uh, then I, I kind of pose the question, but what came before it? And I wanted to write about Stardust first and foremost. And uh, uh, so I posed the question that way to create the, the theme of the book. And then took it back as far as 54 that first uh, race at Las Vegas, Las Vegas Park, and then took it through the tail end of the, the Stardust property. And the Teamsters loans uh, kind of relate that uh, kind of, there weren't Teamster loans in the property, but related to the people who were involved in the property. Uh, my if I may, uh, Sean, sure. my next book is about, I don't mean to pitch, but I'm. I'm uh, pitch away. Okay, I will. I'm. Uh, I'm entering contract for a, a new book about Caesars Palace Grand Prix, the four Grand Prix years, uh, 81 through 84, and uh, the fascinating paths of organized crime on one side that, that developed Caesars Palace and Grand Prix in America and culminating in the Grand Prix. And I'm, already, I'm thinking about what, can I, what might lie beyond that. And, and I've talked to the Speedway about maybe doing an official history for them. Uh, so there's, there's a possibility. Thank you, Randy. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here and your, and your father. Uh, I've enjoyed getting to, getting to know you and, and uh, bump around a bit. And, and uh, I wanna, I wanna, I'm glad you're here. I want to specifically mention your contribution to the book with your anecdotes and, and photos. Steve Westland, uh, uh, one of your, one of your uh, acquaintances, was also very helpful. Ernie Olson uh, with photos. And uh, just the, the, the people. Uh, the detective work that brought the people kind of to the story uh, was, was really, really heartwarming and, and enriching as I, as I worked along the path of the book. Uh, so I'm, again, I'm really happy that you're here tonight. All right, I guess if that's it, uh, just once again, I'd like to thank Randy. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you. Great presentation.